All right, good morning, everyone. If you're watching me sitting here uh, this morning, it's because there's snow outside, and we recorded this Saturday, actually yesterday, and thanks to Christy for coming in to make all of that happen. But we wanted to make sure that uh, we would have a time of fellowship, even if it's only virtually. Um, so a couple of announcements I wanted to make sure that y'all knew about. Uh, it was supposed to start this week, but we will have it begin next week. Our new members class, or we, we like to refer it as getting to know us, uh, where if you've been coming for a while and, and you're thinking about maybe joining with us, um, you can take the class and, and get to know more details about Laurel Hill and, and everything that goes on. But Brother Danny Via will be uh, teaching that class. It usually lasts about three weeks. And and it's at 9 o'clock, so uh, you can be here during the Sunday school hour, or it would be during our early service time as well. So see Brother Danny if you're interested in doing that, or text, call us, and, and we'll, we'll know that you want to be in that. Also, um, I sent it out in the email that uh, we weren't hosting Pacham this year, but we will be providing meals uh, later in February and then in March. Um, I think we have four or five meals that we're going to be providing for the men's shelter. So if you can help with that, now there has to be a main course and desserts and, and, and things cooked, and it's going to be for the men, so it's going to be larger uh, feeding for about 30 people. So if you could see Thea Donaldson about that and let her know and that you can help, she would be happy to get your assistance. So, well, we're going to get started this morning, and let's, let's first, we'll open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for giving us the opportunity just to study your word, Lord, and, and just to hear from you. And, and Lord, I just ask that the, the words that I speak, that everything that uh, comes from me doesn't come from me personally, but comes from you. And Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to live in a country that we still have the freedom to, to speak freely and, and to speak about you. So Lord, we just ask your blessing on this time that we have now. And in your son's name I pray, amen. Well, what I wanted to talk about this morning was what I see as four things that keep us from or separate us from really being close to God. And a lot of what I'm going to say is going to come from the Old Testament because God gave us a lot of examples of, of things that we need to understand. And I would say up front, Jesus gave us the perfect example on, on how we should act, how we should be. But many times when... You know, we talk with each other, and when we say, well, you know, Jesus did it this way, too many times we use the excuse that, well, you know, he was God's son, he was Jesus, he was perfect. So I'm going to give you some other examples, but the first thing that will separate us from God is doubt. Um, and I've categorized this as doubt versus trust. And I'm going to read in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God really said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? What the serpent was doing right there was throwing out this, Are you sure? Are you positive? Did you understand God right? I mean, you know, he said that a while ago, and, you know, it doesn't really apply today. Well, Eve answers, and it says, The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Now, what Eve did there, she added something to it if you look back through the scriptures God says you may not eat from the fruit or you will die he didn't say or touch it now I can just imagine as soon as she said that and it's nowhere in scripture this is just my thoughts of how it may have been the serpent goes you mean this tree right there that one that I'm touching 
you know? Oh, this tree. I'm not dead. I'm not dying. You know, are you, are you sure? And then he looks at her and says, in verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will certainly not die. For God knows that on that day that you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, you know, we know that the serpent was very cunning and we know who the serpent was. And what he was doing to Eve was really pushing her to doubt what she really knew or what she should have known. Um, And when Eve hesitated, she looked, and in verse 5 it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, first, we see where Eve, and Eve gets a bad rap for, you know, being the first one to to fall for it. But she did. But we also see that uh, her husband was there with her um, and could have helped out, and he didn't. But for whatever reason, they fell for that little seed of doubt that the serpent laid out there. And that doubt, very quickly, once they fell into that, it turned into shame because, you know, they realized that they were naked. They realized that, that they had sinned, and, and it says, and, and they were afraid. Now, how do we battle doubt? Well, we have to know what, you know, the truth is, and we have to be able to trust what we know. As a Christian, we have to, you know, it's been said, we have to know what we know. And I want you to look in, uh, well, a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean into your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Now, we know that. I would say most of us who have been in the church for any length of time, you go, oh, yep, I know that verse. Um, but let's read about someone, King Hezekiah, in Second Kings chapter 18. And it says, Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elijah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, became king. And he was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, and the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3 is what I think any Christian should want to be said about them. And it says, He did what was right in the sight of the Lord in accordance with everything his father David had done. It says he removed the high places and smashed the memorial stones to pieces and cast out down the Azareth and he crushed to pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For in those days the sons of Israel had been burning incense to it and it was called Neshuatan. It says he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. And after him, there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who came before him. For he clung to the Lord and did not detest from following him, desist, excuse me, from following him. But he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, can you imagine? I mean, this is, this is written in the Bible, that being said about you, Um, that you did not turn away from the Lord. Um, Now, if you read further in in, uh, 2 Kings there, you know, chapters 18 through 20, you'll see how Hezekiah, he didn't have a perfect 
you know, time as being king. It wasn't easy. The Assyrians threatened Israel. They blasphemed God. And, you know, we'll, we'll see in, uh, if, if you read further in chapter 19, um, when the Assyrians were threatening Israel, that what did Hezekiah do? Grabbed all the, you know, guys in the army together and said, we're going to go out there? No. Um, Hezekiah prayed and asked for help. And it says, And the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. Hezekiah knew that he didn't have the ability to do what God did. And he knew that he had to trust that God would do and protect him as he had promised. So if we look at someone like Hezekiah... We can see where, and, and I, would, I would recommend just go back to Second Kings and, and read about, about him and all that he went through and, and what happened. Um, so if we look at that, we can quickly see how if we don't trust in what we know about God, we will end up doubting what we know. Another thing that will separate us is worry and doubt leads to worry because if you're unsure about something then you get a little upset and you start to worry now this story is is very familiar in luke 2 46 through 48 and it says after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers we're talking about mary and joseph where on their way back home, they realize, we've lost our son. Now, if any of you have ever lost your child for even a brief period of time, you know what that feeling's like. Um, I know my son one time, we were outside, and all of a sudden he disappeared, and I couldn't find him for about a good 30 minutes. And the panic that overwhelms you, um, I had already called the neighbors and asked them to bring the horses and, you know, we were going to have a posse and go looking through the woods because out in the country, that's where, where we were and, and what I was worried uh, had, had happened. Um, fortunately, we found him in the house. He was hiding in a little cabinet. <laughs> so, But for Mary and Joseph, you know, they found him sitting in the temple in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said, Son, why have you done this to us? Those exact words have probably come out of many of your mouths if your child has taken off and you couldn't find him. It's like, why'd you do this to me? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety or worry. And he said to them, Why is it you were looking for me? Did you not know I had to be about my father's affairs? And it says, And yet they on their part did not under the sta statement which he had made. Now let's take Joseph and Mary, whom had both been spoken to by an angel and told who their child was and should have understood that they were raising God's son. And so for them to worry about it was humanly, that we can understand. But because they weren't fully understanding, you know, they had some doubt as, oh, have, have I made a mistake here? Um, I saw uh, in, a, in a journal one time, it said 87% of the things that people worry about, we have absolutely no control over. So most of the things that people get all anxious, upset, worry about, you can't do anything about. So focus on the 13% that maybe you can. Um, and, and in Philippians, in the New Testament, Philippians 4, 6 through 8, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything as well. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for his answers. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, 
which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Think about that. You know, if we will trust God that, you know, we, we know that everything that God allows to happen is for our benefit, for our learning, for our, you know, for, for us to be able to grow closer to him. Even the things that tend to make us worry. Now, peace, on the other hand, how do we find peace? Well, here in uh, 2 Kings, now the backstory on this, and this is uh, a servant of the prophet, prophet Elisha. It says the king of Armenia, Aram, was, he was waging war against Israel. And like usual, Israel was outnumbered. The king was told that Elisha was warning the king of Israel of Aram's plan and that he was even able to tell the Israelite king about his secret plans. Well, this pagan king is going, well, how's he doing this? Where's all the spies? You know, The king was angry and tells his men to find Elisha because I'm going to kill him because I can't have someone who can divulge all of my secrets and, and, and battle plans. And here it says in 2 Kings 6, 15 through uh, 17, it says, Early in the morning, when the attendant of the man of God rose and went out, he saw the forces with its horses and chariots surrounding the city. Alas, he said to Elisha, what shall we do? This was Elisha's servant that goes out, sees the entire city surrounded, and is going, Elisha, what are we going to do? We're all going to die here. Elisha says, do not be afraid. Our side outnumbers then, them. Then he prayed to the O oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And it says, and the Lord opened the eyes of the servant so that he saw the mountainside filled with horses and fiery chariots around Elisha. What the servant wasn't seeing was how God had surrounded them and was protecting them. And interestingly enough, it goes on to say, when the Armenians came against them, Elisha prayed to the Lord and it said, please strike this nation with blindness. So he struck them with blindness. God did, according to Elisha's words. Then Elisha said to them, this is not the way, this is not the city. Follow me, and I'll take you what you're looking for. Now, I have a feeling George Lucas took part of this for his uh, Star Wars movies of these are not the droids you were looking for. <laughs> but, um, but seriously, Elisha prayed to God and said, God, you know, let, let me just take them away. And it says, and he led them to Samaria. And when they entered Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open these men's eyes and let them see. So when their eyes were opened, they looked and discovered they were in Samaria. You know, we're not told of a big bloody battle or anything. And Elisha said, let me just get them out of here. God had his army surrounding them and could have wiped them out very easily. But God took care of it in a different way. And, you know, we have to understand that we have to look at things in our lives and try and see it the way God does and the way that happens is we have to pray and ask God to open our eyes to see things the way he sees them after we're worried worry leads to something else and that's fear and the next part is fear versus courage now, the story of David and Goliath, even people who don't go to church have heard the term David and Goliath. But in 1 Samuel 17, verse 8, it says, He, Goliath, stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out and draw up in battle formation? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man, a representative, and have him come down to me. 
If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I have defied the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man so that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and very fearful. Now, if we look at this and we remember, you know, it says that Saul was a giant and historical accounts or, and, and uh, how tall he was, roughly nine foot nine. So a huge person, not disproportionate. Uh, it, it appears as though, you know, by the armor and everything that he could wear was that he just wasn't this tall skinny thing. He was as big and muscular as he was tall. Now the story goes on. We see this whole army, the king of Israel and his army, who are afraid. And the story goes on to when David comes by, bringing food to his brothers and, and all. And he starts walking around and sees everybody scared and asks, why is everyone afraid? And his brother, Elib, hears him and fusses at him. Accuses him of, you know, you're shirking your duties. You left the sheep out in the field. You know, why are you coming here to harass us and tell us why, we, you know, we're, we're afraid of this nine foot, you know, giant who's going to take off the head of anyone that goes out there. Now, the next part of this is where David answers his brother. Now, many scholars say that David was probably in his early 20s. By the statement that he said, um, I think he was a teenager, because it says, he answered his brother and said, what have I done now? I just ask a question. <laughs> Sounds like something, you know, a 15, 16-year-old would say. I was just asking a question. Um, but truthfully, you know, he was going around, he, he, he didn't get it. They take David to Saul, David, you know, we know the story. David talks with Saul. He tells him about the lion and the bear that he's killed because of God's might. And so Saul finally goes, you know, nobody else is willing to go. Here, take my armor, everything, and go. David says, I can't wear it. But David says, I will go. Now, we know that David only had his staff, his slingshot, and he picked up a few smooth stones. And it says, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a dagger, spear, and sword, but I come against you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel's armies. You have defied him. It says, Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I will strike you down, Cut off your head and give the corpse of the Philistines' camp to the birds of the sky and the creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will hand you over to us. David at that time fully understood and declared, it is not me who is going to beat you. It is God who is going to hand you over to me. And when we don't realize that, when we don't fully grasp that, that's when we really allow ourselves to be afraid. Because we think we have to have the answer we have to be strong enough we have to be smart enough we have to figure a way out of this when God is you know up there going I already have this taken care of all you have to do is ask allow me to do it David you know he showed very plainly how it's like I'm not coming against you in my own strength, in my own abilities, I'm coming against you 
because God is going to deliver you to me. Then we enough fear and and I would say sometimes when uh, you know people get afraid it can lead to one stronger emotion which is anger. Now when anger flares up it can get us in all kinds of trouble and I'm sure all of us whether and it doesn't have to be you know the anger where you pick up a table and throw it across the room you know you can be very passive aggressively angry and our next person I would say kind of exemplifies that passive aggressive anger and I'm talking about Jonah now in the story of Jonah you know we we know the story God tells him you know I want you to go Tell the people of Nineveh to repent. Jonah goes, I don't want to go there. I'm not going there. He runs away. Hops on a boat. He, you know, the storm comes up. He tells the crew, it's my fault. They throw him out. He's swallowed by a great fish. Spit out and ends up, does go to Nineveh. And he preaches. And guess what? The entire city repents. In chapter 4 of Jonah, and, and, and here's where, if, if you look at this, it says, But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. When the whole city, the king, and everyone went, Oh yeah, we're dirty, filthy, rotten sinners. He goes, Then he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was in my own country? I mean, he has the audacity to look at God and say, isn't this what I told you? Therefore, in, of an, in anticipation of this, I fled to Tarshish, since I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in mercy, and one who relents of disaster or doesn't want to harm people. It says, so now, Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is Jonah at his best whining to God, saying, I didn't want to go because they, I knew they were going to repent, and they did, and you're going to forgive them, and I don't want them to be forgiven because I want them to be punished. You know, Jonah was telling God, it's like, no, 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 no. You know, they, they don't deserve to be forgiven. The Lord says in verse 4, but the Lord said, Do you have a good reason to be angry? When Jonah left the city and sat down east of it, he went off to pout. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what was happening in the city. So the Lord designated a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to relieve him of discomfort. And Jonah was overjoyed of the plant. But then God designated a worm. And when dawn came the next day, it attacked the plant and it withered. And when the sun came up, God designated a scorching heat east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. And he begged with all of his soul to die. Death is better than life. Uh, Jonah the whiner. <laughs> but God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, angry even to the point of death. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I also not have compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. You know, God, too many times we forget how loving God is, how compassionate, how forgiving, how understanding he is. And as Christians sometimes... We get that indignant anger. And there again, we can be angry about a lot of things. But 
it, it, it always amazed me how God allowed Jonah to continue to live. And I'm sure it's because he wanted him to be an example to us. You know, Jonah the prophet who uh, didn't want to do what God wanted him to do would, you know, say to God, just kill me now. I don't want to do it. Just let me go. Um, but we also have another story in the Old Testament, the story of Joseph. And we know how, you know, Joseph, his his father loved him, you know, made him the coat of many colors. And the dreams that he had that he told to his his brothers about, you know, the moon and the stars and, and, and everything bowing down to him. And, you know, they hated him because of it. So, so much so that... They took him out and they took his coat and soaked it in blood and took it back to his father and said, yeah, he's dead. Wild animal took care of him, you know, he killed him. When in actuality, what they had done is they had sold him into slavery. Um, one of his brothers saved him from being killed, but sold him into slavery. And we know the story of, of, of Joseph as to how he go, you know, is sold into slavery and you know, the, being able to interpret the dreams of, of the king and everything and ends up being the one in charge of Egypt. You know, he's not the king, but he's in charge of everything. And here we see it says, after, after this, you know, people from around the area. Now, Joseph understood the dreams that he had been given and, and had interpreted from the king and knew that the famine was coming. So he had started storing up stuff. So, you know, Egypt had become the big warehouse where all the food and everything was stored. So all the tribes and groups from around started coming to Egypt asking for help. You know, we, we, we need food. And... That's what happened with Joseph's family. And, and you know, if, if, if you read through all of that, you'll see how his brothers came and they asked and he gave them grain. And, you know, he, he, you know it went back and forth uh, a little bit. And, and he was testing them. Um, but, but then towards the end, when he finally reveals himself to his brothers, it says, Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of his, all of his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him, and he revealed his identity to his brothers. But he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and also Pharaoh's household heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. The most powerful person, you know, they were standing in front of, and he went, yeah, I'm the brother that you tried to kill. You sold into slavery. Then Joseph said to the brothers, please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land two years, and there will be five more years without plowing, without harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by great deliverance therefore it was not you who sent me here but God he has made me a father to Pharaoh's lord of his entire household and ruler over all the land of Egypt Joseph understood that what appeared to be a horrific thing that had happened to him had happened for a very specific reason. And it was so that specifically he could save his people. It goes on to say, he says, Return quickly to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph said. God has made me Lord of all over Egypt. Come down to me without delay. You can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me, you and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all you have, and there I will sustain you, for there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you and your household and everything you have will become destitute. And it goes on to say how they came back and, and, and how there was this 
great family reunion. And what we have to realize is no matter what happens to us, God does work it together for our benefit, for his purpose. And, and when, when we can fully grasp that, Joseph seemed to be able to, whether it was because he got thrown in prison for false accusations of Potiphar's wife and, and all. Um, and it says, in, you know, in verse 15, it said, Joseph kissed each of his brothers as he wept, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. These were the ones who wanted him dead. So I think if we look at these four different stages that we can allow ourselves to go through if we're not careful, um, these stories can help us see that there are others. And, you know, th th there were men who lived in the Old Testament. These were real men. You know, Jesus did give us the perfect example, but these were other men who did great things. And there's many more of them that have done that. But what I want to leave you with is that we have to realize that when we doubt, we do so because we don't have full understanding of God's word, of who God is. We doubt when we don't take the time to pray and ask God for guidance and direction and read his word in order to be able to understand. We worry about the things that we don't see and we don't feel like we can control. Um, it was like, you know, with Elisha's servants, it's like until he could see what really was protecting them, he didn't understand. When we fear, it's because we're trusting in our own abilities. We're not trusting in God because we know our human frailties, our weaknesses, our inabilities to do things, and that's what causes us to fear, and we have to realize that we have to rely on God. And the last thing is, when we get angry, we have to be very careful because usually anger comes because God's plan doesn't fit my agenda. I get angry because it's not going the way I want. And like Joan, I'm going to pitch a fit because I don't want to be sick. I don't want to have to go through, you know, the loss of a job. I don't want to have to go through this hardship, whatever it may be. But whatever is happening is happening for a reason, for our benefit. And for the benefit of others. I mean, these stories that we see in the Old Testament, you know, have been around for how many thousands of years? And that we can look at and, and see examples of really how God loves us, how he cares for us, takes care of us, is constantly watching over us, and is willing to step in any time that all we have to do is open our eyes and our ears and our mouth and ask. So today, I guess that's what I wanted to, to leave you with is don't doubt. You know, you, you, you need to have understanding and, you know, don't worry. Trust, you know, don't be afraid. You know, it's not you that's got the answers. It's God. And don't get angry. Really, don't get angry. So... If we will, you know, there have been, uh, you know, many things, the term of what would Jesus do and, and, and all, and, and we sing songs about, you know, having God to help us to see things the way he does and understand that. So I encourage you to do at least two things. Number one, pray. And number two, along with that, is to read your Bible to look for those answers. Read some of these stories in the Old Testament and uh, you'll, you'll be able to see that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the stories of the, the great men of old and even the not so great men of old who give us those examples of how we should and how we should not act. 
And Lord, we just thank you so much for your son Jesus who did give us the perfect example of, of all of that, all wrapped up into one. Your son who, as, as your word says, you know, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He was on the cross knowing full well the ones that put him there were the ones that he was dying for. And Lord, we just thank you so much for loving us so much, your patience and your grace and your mercy to us. It's in your son's name I pray, amen.